All right, so welcome everybody to this webinar, um, an hygienist practitioner webinar. Um, and we're going to be talking about magnesium, um, the missing mineral for women's health. Um, so during the webinar, you can ask any questions that you have. My colleague, Dr. Nina Bailey, will um, try and answer those during the webinar. And if not, um, then we'll try and get back to you after that. So I read an article about the role of magnesium in gynecological practice. Um, and it was really interesting because there was such a broad range of conditions um, in women's health that magnesium seemed to either prevent or help. And that's what inspired me to put together um, this talk. So um, in the webinar, we're going to look at um, just recapping the basics of magnesium, where we can get it in the diet and what might cause a deficiency. And then it's some um, conditions that magnesium can influence. So dysmenorrhea, menstrual migraines, PMS, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, pregnancy, various menopausal symptoms, a little bit of thyroid health. And then if we've got time at the end, um, just some thoughts on how to, what to look for in choosing a magnesium supplement. So to recap, um, magnesium is the fourth most abundant cation in the body and it plays a large um, role as a coenzyme. Um, it plays a role in over 300 biochemical reactions. So really a deficiency of magnesium can affect so many systems in the body. It plays a role in energy production. Um, so ATP must be bound to magnesium to be biologically active. And then it plays a whole host of other functions in protein synthesis, blood glucose control, um, in the active transport of ions across cell membranes. Um, so uh, when nerve impulses are conducted, um, muscle contraction and relaxation, um, maintaining vasomotor tone, so keeping blood vessels at um, the right state of uh, contraction and dilation, and um, plays a part in controlling normal heart rhythm the heart being a muscle and um, with its own neurological system as well. And then magnesium plays a structural role in um, bones, proteins, enzymes, DNA and RNA. And um, it has immunological functions. So it activates macrophages, um, contributing to our host defense system and also influences lymphocyte proliferation, um, a kind of white blood cell. So in the body, 99% of the total magnesium is found intracellularly, so not in the bloodstream, so in bones, muscles, and soft tissue. So it's not always that accurate measuring um, blood levels of magnesium, and it's not a, um, a test that's often done, um, just because it's not entirely representative of how much magnesium is stored in the body. So if... Um, if one was to do a um, serum magnesium level and it was really low, that would probably um, represent magnesium depletion in the whole body, but it, it could also be normal, even if there was um, depleted magnesium within the cells and within the stores. And um, serum magnesium is tightly regulated, kept at a constant level by a balance between how much is absorbed in the intestines, how much is excreted in the kidneys, and also um, the bones can release magnesium into the bloodstream if it is low in the bloodstream. So you can see how um, low magnesium could lead to osteoporosis because the magnesium would be drawn out of the bones to keep the blood level stable. And then um, just a word about the excretion in the kidneys. So as the blood passes through the kidneys, um, some of the magnesium does get reabsorbed um, into the bloodstream. And that can actually vary really widely between naught and 99%, depending on um, the magnesium status in the body. So um, just a, a word about the previous slide. So measuring magnesium levels, um, is the most common way is by doing a red blood cell magnesium level. Um, and that's slightly more accurate because it's does represent um, intracellular magnesium. Um, and then ionized magnesium um, is more accurate, but it's a more expensive specialist test. 
So magnesium in the diet, in the UK, our daily reference intake is 375 milligrams. And the richest dietary sources are um, often foods that you would find in a healthy whole food, plant-based diet with a bit of magnesium from seafood as well. So we find magnesium in whole grains, in green leafy vegetables, and actually the center of the chlorophyll um, contains magnesium, which is why, why it's in the green, green leaves. Um, magnesium is also in beans, nuts and seeds, and cocoa. Now, some of those foods do contain high levels of phytates and the magnesium um, is bound to the phytate. So it's not all, not all the magnesium that we take in is bioavailable to be absorbed. And then drinking water also contains magnesium and that can form about 10% of the daily intake. And um, this is one mineral that um, vegetarians and vegans can actually have a higher level higher intake of magnesium because they're eating more of um, these whole food, plant-based um, foods that we talked about above. Um, all of us are probably taking in less magnesium um, than we would have um, in times gone by because of the declining mineral levels in the soil. Um, and also processing and refining decreases magnesium. So um, standard Western diets are generally low in magnesium. All right, so let's have a look at some factors um, that could influence magnesium deficiency. So um, if you look at the, basically the, the lowest, the minimum required magnesium intake, one in five women aged 19 to 34 years um, have intakes below um, that level. And um, it's especially high um, a low magnesium intake is especially prevalent in teenagers. So 51% of girls age 11 to 14 and 53% of the 11 to 18 year old age group um, have a low magnesium intake and um, slightly better in boys, but it's still um, a mineral that a lot of us are getting too little of. Then um, decreased absorption. So <clears throat> oxalates can decrease the amount of magnesium that's absorbed. Um, so raw spinach, um, coffee, um, and then phytates, like I said, can bind to magnesium, preventing them, preventing it being absorbed. Um, drinking a lot of caffeine or alcohol and carbonated drinks also um, play a role in decreased absorption. And then certain medication like proton pump inhibitors um, can decrease magnesium absorption. And we know that some people are on um, PPIs for many years, even decades. And then um, anything that um, affects the gastrointestinal system um, can decrease nutrient and um, absorption in general will also, can also decrease magnesium absorption. And then certain conditions can cause increased magnesium excretion by the kidneys. So being under stress, um, just by itself, whether it's emotional stress or physical stress, increases magnesium excretion. Um, certain medication, so for example, diuretics, which can be taken for um, hypertension or cardiac failure. And then um, kidney disease, which affects um, the reabsorption of magnesium. And then certain people are just genetically predisposed to perhaps absorb less magnesium or have abnormal distribution of it in the body. And then um, as we age, we um, deposit less magnesium in bones and soft tissues. Um, we absorb less magnesium in the gut and also um, excrete more in the urine. So magnesium is especially important as we age. So it's very rare to um, overdose on magnesium or have um, hypermagnesemia, so more magnesium than we need. And um, that's because um, the kidneys can really um, excrete all of it if it needs to. So we would only really see um, hypermagnesemia if someone had excessive intake and they had had kidney failure preventing them um, from excreting it. And um, some symptoms of that could be low blood pressure, muscle paralysis, and bowel paralysis. So from that, we can see that um, 
giving magnesium might actually be a good thing if we're trying to lower blood pressure, treat um, muscle cramps or spasms, and um, possibly even bowel cramping. Um, and then hypomagnesemia. So mostly this is asymptomatic or if someone had chronically low magnesium levels, they might develop other illnesses which wouldn't be um, immediately linked to um, low magnesium level. But um, so magnesium, magnesium can cause um, inflammation if one has a magnesium deficiency and that could lead to a host of chronic illnesses which um, yeah, aren't always linked to uh, magnesium and other nutrient deficiencies. But in the case of an acute deficiency, um, one could see muscle weakness and cramps, um, tetany, so that's um, cramps affecting the hands and the feet mostly. Um, in extreme cases, um, one could get seizures and also cardiac arrhythmias. And then let's have a look at magnesium and its role in women's health conditions. So that's the reference to the article that has um, loads of information. And if you're interested, I'd really recommend it. Um, so most of, a lot of the information comes from that article and then the studies that are um, referenced in the article. All right, so um, dysmenorrhea, the first um, condition we're going to talk about. So. So basically painful periods that um, precede or accompany menses. Um, and dysmenorrhea affects um, a lot of women throughout their lifetime and in about 20% of women it's severe enough to interfere with their daily activities. And it's thought to occur because of a few different factors. So the one is um, myometrial hypercontractility. So basically the muscle of the uterus contracts really strongly. Um, so it's trying to push the blood out basically. So that's in a way a normal physiological um, action, but that obviously does cause some cramping pain. Then um, arteriola vasoconstriction. So the blood vessels supplying um, the lining of the uterus do constrict and that's part of the reason why um, the endometrium breaks down. Um, and becomes blood. And um, that lack of blood supply in itself also causes some ischemic pain. So pain because of a lack of oxygen supply. And then um, also inflammatory compounds are released, which um, give rise to a lot of the symptoms. So if we just look at the diagram below, so after ovulation, so in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, um, there's a buildup of omega-6 fatty acids in the cell membranes. And then before menses, um, progesterone levels drop, the cells break down, and omega-6 fatty acids are released, um, including arachidonic acid, which gives rise to inflammatory compounds such as prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which then um, further enhance the inflammatory cascade and give, that gives rise to symptoms like cramps, nausea, vomiting, bloating, and headaches. Um, so you can see that magnesium um, could be useful um, in a lot of, well, in all of those areas because for the contraction of the uh, myometrium, it's a muscle relaxant due to its calcium channel blocking activity. So it could sort of calm down the, the contraction of the uterine wall. Um, it also pl um, plays a role in dilating blood vessels. So possibly it could um, stop that arteriola vasoconstriction in a, in a small way. And then also um, it has anti-inflammatory action. So um, it could counteract some of that inflammatory cascade that we see. Um, so a study was, look, was done looking at um, primary dysmenorrhea. So that's dysmenorrhea that um, basically um, doesn't happen because of some other occurrence and often happens, you know, right from adolescence that um, when women experience a bit of, um, well, painful periods. And just um, looking at the serum magnesium levels in these young girls. And all of the young girls had um, lower levels of serum magnesium than the girls without dysmenorrhea. All 
right, so giving magnesium to treat dysmenorrhea. So, um, so basically dys dysmenorrhea is um, often treated with anti-inflammatory drugs, um, with um, TENS machines maybe, but some people might, um, you know, not want to take anti-inflammatory drugs and might prefer more natural treatment. Um, and magnesium can be very effective to treat dysmenorrhea. So in a Cochrane review, um, three placebo-controlled studies were looked at. And in general, it was found that magnesium was significantly more effective than placebo for pain relief. Uh, one of the studies looked at ibuprofen use and found that there was less need for additional ibuprofen. Um, absence from work greatly decreased. And in one of the studies, they measured the prostaglandins in the menstrual blood um, every two months over the study. And they found that there were 45% less prostaglandins um, and 21 out of 25 women in that study showed a decline in symptoms. And, um, you know, there's no standard dose and regimen um, used in the studies. Each study uses its own regimen, but in clinical practice, you could try, um, you know, different regimens and doses and see what worked for your clients, but it can be very effective. And then there's an open label study um, by Benassi, which showed that magnesium greatly reduced symptoms compared to pre-treatment control cycles. All right, and then going along with um, menstrual related issues, a lot of women suffer from menstrual migraines. Um, some of them only have migraines related to their menstrual cycle and some maybe have them at other times of the month as well, but their threshold is just lowered around the times of their menses. And it's thought that about 50% of women have suffered migraines related to their menstrual cycle at some time or other in their life. It can often be genetic as well, running in families. So these migraines can be with or without um, aura. They're usually more debilitating and more prone to recurrence and less responsive to acute treatment than non-menstrual migraine attacks and can carry on for, um, you know, more than the usual few hours or day. Um, one of the mechanisms specifically related to um, the time of the month is thought to be due to a fall in estrogen, which modulates neuronal activity and receptor density. And um, we know that normal plasma levels of magnesium are required for proper functioning of blood vessels. Um, and that low magnesium can predispose to vascular spasm. And at the start of um, a migraine, there, there is a lot of spasm, um, which later gives way to dilatation. But, um, you know, one could think that if magnesium levels are low, that there would be more, um, less threshold to, for the um, arteries to go into spasm. All right, so in the study, um, so serum ionized magnesium levels were looked at and also the ionized calcium to magnesium ratios um, in women with menstrual migraines. So um, magnesium and calcium levels were measured during and between um, migraine attacks. And the incidence of magnesium deficiency, women who had migraines during their menses, 45% um, of them had a low serum ionized magnesium level. And then quite interestingly, if they had migraines at a different time of the month, not during their menses, um, then basically they had only, uh, what's that, 14 to 15% only were, were deficient in magnesium. Um, and the serum calcium levels were normal, but the calcium magnesium ratio um, was elevated in menstrual migraine. All right, so uh, magnesium can be used um, therapeutically or preventatively. And it seems that there's um, some quite uh, good evidence for prophylactic magnesium in migraines. Um, so there are two hypotheses. Um, the one is that a lack of magnesium promotes platelet hyperaggregation and cortical spreading depression. Um, so cortical spreading depression is it's a wave of depolarization that spreads across the cerebral cortex 
causing inflammation around the meningeal blood vessels. And um, it's thought that magnesium also impairs serotonin receptor function and influences neurotransmitter synthesis and release. So that's really on the phys physiological level how magnesium could um, prevent migraine attacks. But then also um, for a lot of people, they have um, triggers that are um, emotion, emotionally related. So um, uh, stress, anxiety um, can trigger migraines. Um, but we know that uh, magnesium is depleted anyway under conditions of stress. And we also know that magnesium supplementation Im improves the emotional stress response. So it decreases anxiety. Um, so if, if somebody could be less anxious, um, less stressed or have their magnesium topped up a little bit, they might have less of a um, threshold to develop a migraine. So in a study by Picot, um, he gave um, women uh, either magnesium or placebo um, daily for 12 weeks. And he found a 41.6% reduction in the frequency of migraines um, in the mag magnesium arm and 15.8% in the placebo arm. Um, and the number of days with migraine and the drug consumption decreased significantly, more so in the magnesium arm. But it's interesting that even giving a placebo did decrease um, the frequency. And then um, Facinetti looked at menstrual migraine. So um, for the first two cycles, the woman received no treatment. And then for another two cycles, they received either oral magnesium um, or placebo from um, cycle day 15 to menses onset. Um, so the woman had fewer days with headache um, as well as fewer other premenstrual complaints. Um, and the pain was significantly um, decreased in the magnesium group. He found that intracellular magnesium levels were decreased in menstrual migraine sufferers. Um, and interestingly, supplementation increased magnesium levels in the white blood cells, um, but he found no change um, in the plasma or the red blood cells. But um, looking at the white blood cell magnesium con um, concentration, he did find an inverse correlation between pain and magnesium. So those who had a, more magnesium in their white blood cells experienced less pain. All right, and then premenstrual syndrome. Um, so this is a, a cluster of physical and emotional symptoms that occurs after ovulation. Um, and leading up to menses. So physical symptoms could be um, fatigue, bloating, abdominal pain, breast tenderness, headaches, changes in appetite, um, even worsened acne and greasy hair. And then emotional symptoms, um, so feeling anxious or irritable, um, mood swings and insomnia. And I'm sure that almost all women have been affected um, to some degree. All right, so Rosenstein evaluated magnesium levels across the menstrual cycle in women with and without PMS. And what he found was um, significantly low red blood cells um, and white blood cell magnesium concentrations. But it wasn't only during the time that these women were suffering from PMS symptoms. It was actually at various time points during the month. Um, which um, you know, a thought could be then that if one topped up magnesium levels throughout the month, um, would that be um, helpful? And um, is a general magnesium deficiency making one more likely to get PMS? All right, let's have a look at um, a few studies that use magnesium for PMS. So um, Facinetti's study um, so women got magnesium or placebo from day 15 to the onset of menses, and um, there was a significant reduction in PMS symptoms. Then um, Walker gave women a magnesium oxide versus placebo for two months. The reason I put the magnesium oxide in there was just because um, magnesium oxide is a really low bioavailability magnesium, so we might see um, quicker or better results with another sort of magnesium. Um, 
So these women got magnesium um, daily for two months. Um, so in the first month, they showed no change in symptoms. And then in the second month, they had significant reduction in symptoms of weight gain, um, swelling of the extremities, breast tenderness, and abdominal bloating. Uh, then in a third study, Quaranta gave women magnesium from day 20 of their menstrual cycles until their menses onset. Um, and their premenstrual symptoms were decreased by a third. And then um, in another study, magnesium oxide um, did significantly reduce premenstrual symptoms and the effect was amplified if given together with vitamin B6. And just to support that, um, in our last study by D'Souza, either magnesium or magnesium plus B6 were given for PMS symptoms. And the combination of magnesium and B6 were found to be um, more effective than magnesium alone, especially for anxiety-related um, symptoms. So from that, um, from all those studies, we can draw the conclusion that magnesium um, is effective for PMS, especially when combined with vitamin B6, um, but at least two months may be needed to appreciate benefits. So endometriosis is a condition where the cells lining the uterus, the endometrium, are found outside of the uterus within the abdominal cavity. And um, during the menstrual cycle, as the endometrial lining builds up, these cells also build up. Um, and then when the end endometrial lining breaks down and becomes blood, basically the same happens in the endometrial tissue, in the abdominal cavity. Um, this causes pain and inflammation and, and scar tissue. And it affects 10 to 15% of premenopausal women. So um, studies were done looking at uh, magnesium intake in women who had endometriosis compared to women who didn't. Um, and women with endometriosis have, were found to have a significantly decreased magnesium intake um, in their diet. Um, we also know that once women develop endometriosis, they would be predisposed to having um, their magnesium used up because of the stress state. Um, so um, increased excretion in the urine because um, endometriosis would be a physical stressor if they were experiencing pain and inflammation. And then we could also um, think of um, magnesium helping endometriosis by relieving cramping um, because of its action on smooth muscle. Um, so, if, um, so endometriosis is sometimes found along the fallopian tubes and in women with um, endometriosis, their fallopian tubes um, don't have a sort of smooth rhythmic contraction, but they can get a bit spasmodic. So um, it could calm that down. Um, also magnesium's anti-inflammatory action um, and then also endometriosis is often accompanied by depression and anxiety and magnesium could help for that. So there are a lot of um, therapeutic areas that um, magnesium could address. All right, so polycystic ovarian um, syndrome um, is a combination of cysts on the ovaries accompanied by hormone imbalance. So um, androgen and estrogen dominance, and often insulin resistance as well. So um, in a study looking at the nutrient patterns um, and the risk of polycystic ovary syndrome, um, it was found that a higher intake of magnesium was actually protective. Um, and a woman with a lower intake had a higher in, um, incidence of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then in another study looking at um, dietary fiber and magnesium <clears throat> associated with insulin resistance um, and hormone levels in polycystic ovarian syndrome, it was found that, um, so in women who already have PCOS, those with insulin resistance um, consumed less fiber and less magnesium and had a greater glycemic load. So basically had a poorer diet overall. 
and magnesium intake was also negatively correlated with CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, and testosterone, um, sorry, negatively correlated with those. Um, so those who had less magnesium intake had, a, had higher inflammation and testosterone levels. Um, and it was positively correlated with HDL, so um, the thought to be the more beneficial type of cholesterol. Um, those women who had a higher magnesium intake had a higher HDL. So in summary, low magnesium may predispose to PCOS, um, and those who already have the condition and have low magnesium intake may be more likely to develop the consequences of insulin resistance, inflammation, and hormonal imbalance. Um, so in the study, um, magnesium and vitamin E were given um, to women with polycystic ovary syndrome, looking at hormonal status and um, biomarkers of inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, so women were given um, magnesium and vitamin E um, or placebo for 12 weeks. And um, those who received the magnesium had a significant reduction in hirsutism, so that's um, unwanted facial hair, and CRP, so um, biomarker of inflammation, and a significant increase in plasma nitric oxide and total antioxidant ca um, capacity. So um, <clears throat> nitric oxide, um, it is produced naturally by your body, and also it's boosted by intake of certain foods like beetroot, rocket, and walnut, and it's really important in vasodilation, so relaxing the blood vessels, um, promoting good circulation, and it's essential for overall health um, because it allows um, blood carrying nutrients and oxygen to reach all parts of the body. And a limited capacity pr to produce um, nitric oxide is associated with many chronic conditions such as heart disease and diabetes. All right, and then moving on to pregnancy. So um, the normal magnesium home homeostasis is more difficult for the body to maintain during pregnancy for a few reasons. So there's increased demand from the fetus. Um, it is a state of stress, so there's um, more magnesium excreted. And um, then there's also inflammation in the placenta and the blood vessels. Um, and we find that even in normal pregnancies, magnesium responsive genes are upregulated. So this suggests a relative decrease in magnesium. It's thought that um, increased urinary magnesium excretion and a general sort of slight magnesium insufficiency is related to blood pressure increase in pregnancies. And in pregnancies complicated by preeclampsia, um, it has been found that magnesium homeostasis is dysfunctional. So um, preeclampsia is a condition where with raised blood pressure and protein excretion in the urine, um, which complicates some pregnancies. And um, uh, when it sort of becomes uh, severe, women can either go on to develop eclampsia, which um, is a condition where they have seizures, or the HELP syndrome, um, which consists of um, hemolysis, so um, red blood cell breakdown, um, elevated liver enzymes with liver damage, and low platelets, um, which is a risk of um, gives a risk of bleeding. Um, so, in in women with preeclampsia, um, they have been found to have lower magnesium levels in their red blood cell membranes, their brains, muscles, and maternal and umbilical cord blood, and um, so supplementation with magnesium has shown beneficial effects um, both on high blood pressure and preeclampsia in some studies. And then also it has been shown to increase pregnancy, to improve pregnancy outcomes in some studies, um, such as a decrease in premature births and low birth weight infants. Um, the evidence isn't so strong that um, all pregnant women are advised to take supplemental magnesium yet, but um, it is really a good idea to make sure that women are getting at least enough magnesium in their diets if they're not taking any supplement, supplemental magnesium. So 
So on the antenatal ward, um, magnesium is given intravenously or intramuscularly for some really serious conditions such as um, preterm labor. So magnesium, because of its calcium channel blocking activity, can relax the smooth muscle of the uterus and suppress preterm labor. And then also in eclampsia or threatened eclampsia, it can be used um, to prevent seizures or to prevent further seizures. So um, postnatal depression, um, so, so we know that low serum magnesium levels are associated, can be associated with depression and conversely magnesium does have an antidepressant effect um, due to magnesium's influence on the nervous system and the release and metabolism of neurotransmitters. So um, if, if women, if many women, young women who are not taking in enough magnesium um, go into pregnancy already magnesium depleted, one can think that during the pregnancy, there's further increase, um, increased demand on their magnesium, um, coupled with the inflammation and the, the stress of pregnancy, they could get to the end of their pregnancy even more magnesium depleted, and they could have a greater risk of postpartum depression. All right, and then um, moving on to um, women in the menopausal age. So magnesium can help with quite a few of the symptoms of menopause, um, such as hot flushes, low energy, mood symptoms, and bone health. So we'll look at um, most of these in a little bit more detail. Um, low energy, we, we won't go into any more um, other than to say that um, magnesium is, is known um, to play a big role in energy production um, due to its role in binding to ATP, um, making it biologically active. All right, so magnesium and, and hot flashes. So um, studies have been done in women with breast cancer and hot flashes to see what effect um, magnesium has on them. Um, the reason women with breast cancer are chosen is that um, most women with um, severe hot flashes who are treated um, in Western medicine will have hormone replacement therapy, but in women with breast cancer, that um, wouldn't be an option. So that's, that's why these, these women were chosen. So um, in two, two studies were um, where magnesium oxide um, was given in an open label fashion. So um, there was no placebo involved, women um, knew what they were taking. <clears throat> in one study, women took um, magnesium oxide three times daily for four weeks. Um, and in 45% of these women, their hot flashes resolved completely. In another 45%, there was a 50% reduction in symptoms um, and 10% had no change. Um, and in another study, um, magnesium oxide was given, um, I think just once a day, I'm not sure. Um, and 56% of women had a greater than 50% reduction in hot flash score. 76% um, had a greater than 25% reduction. And then other symptoms were also significantly reduced, such as fatigue, sweating, and distress. Um, unfortunately, these studies weren't quite backed up by a larger placebo-controlled study um, where magnesium oxide did improve symptoms, but no more um, than placebo. So what do we take from this? Um, I think it definitely is still worth trying magnesium um, for women who are looking for a more natural solution to hot flashes. Um, in some, it seems like it would be very effective. Um, possibly in some it wouldn't, um, but it probably won't do any harm. Um, and yeah, interestingly enough, there, it seems that there was maybe quite a large placebo effect in these studies, but I think it is still something that, that could definitely have benefit in clinical practice, at least for some women, it's worth a try. All right, and then um, mood symptoms. So depression, anxiety, and mood swings um, affect almost all perimenopausal women in some way. So we know in animal models um, that a magnesium deficient diet um, enhances depression and anxiety related behavior. And 
conversely, magnesium supplementation um, induces an antidepressant effect. And that's borne out in postmenopausal women with depression as well. So um, in this observational study by Stanislavska, um, he found significantly lower magnesium concentrations in postmenopausal women with depressive symptoms compared to healthy controls. And then anxiety, so not only in postmenopausal women, but in general, very common. So 8.2 million cases of anxiety in the UK. Um, and the one week prevalence of generalized anxiety um, is 6.6%, with women um, almost twice as likely to be diagnosed with anxiety um, disorders than men. So um, magnesium and anxiety, um, there, there are a few physiological mechanisms. So um, the one is magnesium inhibits NMDA receptor stimulation in the brain. So NMDA receptors are N-methyl D-aspartate receptors, and they're stimulated by glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And if they are excessively stimulated, um, this leads to cognitive and mood disorders like anxiety. So under normal circumstances, um, the magnesium in the extracellular fluids um, guard against NMDA receptor stimulation. So uh, um, the decrease in magnesium can cause hyperstimulation of these receptors causing anxiety. Then magnesium also promotes GABA receptor function. So GABA receptors are stimulated by GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, um, which promotes calm and relaxation. And magnesium binds GABA to the GABA receptor, um, helping to prevent excessive neuronal stimulation that can result in anxiety. And then magnesium also has a role in um, the hormonal system. So um, it reduces the secretion of ACTH, cortisol, and adrenaline from the pituitary and adrenal glands. Um, and cortisol and adrenaline are the two main hormones involved in the fight and flight response. So quite a few different mechanisms and magnesium can be very effective for treating anxiety. All right, then um, moving on to the postmenopausal period, which is a, um, the period when the most um, change in bone mineral density happens. So there's a drastic loss in bone mineral density after menopause. And magnesium is a known risk factor for osteoporosis. Um, and through a few mechanisms. So a lack of magnesium decreases osteoblast and increases osteoclast activity. Um, so osteoblasts are the cells that make new bone and osteoclasts are the cells that break down bone. And um, it does this through two mechanisms. So firstly, because of inflammation. So if um, there's magnesium deficiency, then it has been shown that tumor necrosis factor and the interleukins are increased in both the serum and the bone marrow. And then also through increased oxidative stress. Um, so yeah, so, that, so basically there's an imbalance between the amount of new bone that's being produced and the amount that's being broken down. It also um, prevents optimal crystal formation. So instead of the crystals being um, kind of slightly unevenly stacked, they become very, um, it's almost like when you're using Lego to build a wall, you teach children to overlap the different Lego pieces to make the wall more strong. Well, these ones are all stacked on top of each other and makes the bone more likely to break. And a lack of magnesium also in, increases the number of osteoclasts generated from the bone marrow precursors. And it also promotes endothelial dysfunction. <clears throat> so we talked about um, the nitric oxide. So less nitric oxide would be produced, um, causing the blood vessels to be more constricted maybe than usual. And some have suggested that osteoporosis could be a vascular disease of the bone. Um, so, in the study by uh, Madhavi Roshan, um, he 
looked at the mean dietary intake of magnesium, zinc, and calcium in postmenopausal women with low bone mineral density and found that all of these minerals were um, significantly lower in their diets than the recommended daily allowance. And a um, study by Aiden showed that oral magnesium supplementation raised the serum levels of osteocalcin significantly and decreased markers of bone resorption. So osteocalcin is a marker of bone formation. Um, so uh, magnesium can be seen as a really important mineral for um, both preventing osteoporosis and supplementing in women that are diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia. Um, and it's never too late to start thinking about your bone health. Um, so we know that the period um, of adolescence and very early adult life is a really important time to build up good bone mineral density. Um, so in a study, magnesium was um, given for 12 months um, to adolescent girls and was shown to have a positive effect on the accrual of hip bone mass. And as we said earlier, it's um, especially the adolescent age group that tend to have decreased magnesium in their diet. All right, and then postmenopausal colon cancer. So this is um, really um, a common form of cancer in postmenopausal women. So you probably heard about the Women's Health Initiative study. So of those 161,000 women, um, 140,000 women were looked at for the sub-study. And um, in the study duration, 2,380 women developed colorectal cancer during the study and was looked at um, dietary intake by self-report and as well as supplemental magnesium intake. And there was an inverse relationship between the highest total magnesium intake um, and the lowest risk of colon cancer um, and with a borderline significant relationship for rectal cancer. Um, so, so this supported the hypothesis that um, a magnesium intake um, from about 400 milligrams a day from either dietary or supplemental use or combination of both um, was associated with the lower incidence of colorectal cancer in postmenopausal women. All right, um, there's a bit about the physiology, but I think we won't look at that now. And then just a brief note, just, to, just because thyroid um, health is um, a woman's health issue as well, tied into the whole um, endocrine system. Um, magnesium plays a role in the production of thyroid hormone and um, plays a role in um, converting T4 to T3 and deficiency is also a cause of goiter. So what to look for when you choose a quality magnesium supplement. Um, so we'll just look at a few factors such as looking at um, the carriers that the magnesium is bound to, um, the elemental fraction of magnesium, and then what fully reacted means, and whether you should take the magnesium, um, you know, all in one go or in split doses throughout the day. So basically, you'll never find a plain magnesium supplement. It will always be bound to a carrier. And um, you get different carriers. So um, most, most of the carriers are salts, and you get organic salts and inorganic salts. So um, the organic soluble salts, um, which have a higher bioavailability, are citrate, lactate, and gluconate. And um, then there are also inorganic salts, um, chloride and sulfate, and then the inorganic insoluble salts like oxide and carbonate. Um, so of those, magnesium oxide is the cheapest, most widely used form in supplements. And it also has really low bioavailability. So it's only 4% um, bioavailable. Um, however, it is often used to boost label claims because of the total bulk magnesium, the elemental percentage is really high in oxide, but it's really um, uh, low in bioavailability and it can also cause diarrhea. So often when people take a supplement complaining of diarrhea, um, it's often magnesium oxide that's to blame. And then magnesium can also be 
bound um, to in amino acid complexes like magnesium bisglycinate and taurate. So we'll have a look at those now. Okay, so um, when you see a magnesium supplement, there'll always be a bulk amount and then an elemental um, amount in milligrams. If there's, if you only see one um, one amount on the bottle, then it's probably the bulk magnesium. But quality supplements should label the bulk and the elemental fraction. And like I said, the bioavailability varies with magnesium oxide having the highest magnesium elemental fraction, but really low bioavailability. And then down at the bottom, you'll see um, the glycinate and the taurinate, they've got low elemental um, magnesium percentages, but they are really bioavailable. They get absorbed um, really well. So when you look at a supplement, it might look like it doesn't really have as much magnesium in it, but it's important to look at what form of magnesium it is. Um, so magnesium salts like magnesium citrate um, are liberated from their carrier in the acidic environment of the stomach. And then they can either be absorbed by paracellular transport between the cells um, of the intestine, which is the main um, absorption pathway, or transcellularly. Um, so um, they need sufficient acid in the stomach to liberate them. So um, a magnesium salt is not the best choice of person for a person with low stomach acid um, because the magnesium might not be liberated from the salt. Um, so to increase magnesium absorption, um, in our magnesium supplement, we've used three different types of magnesium. So we've used magnesium citrate, but then also we've um, used the amino acid carriers um, of taurate and glycinate. And by this, we can use different absorption pathways to ensure that we have the best chance that as much magnesium will be absorbed as possible. So um, the magnesium citrate gets absorbed um, through the paracellular pathways mostly, and then the magnesium taurate, taurinate gets absorbed through the amino acid transporters, um, that's for single amino acids, and then um, the magnesium bisglycinate that's a, um, gets absorbed through the dipeptide channels. Um, so for peptides composed of two amino acid residues. And also um, the magnesium bisglycinate because um, it, it, it's preventing the magnesium from um, binding to phytates, preventing um, its absorption. So um, these amino acid um, actually have different benefits. So the one is in the absorption, they get absorbed by different channels to the magnesium salts. Um, they also keep the pH um, at the, uh, right, the right level, so the citrate um, can be liberated and absorbed. Um, and also, um, hmm, I forgot what I was gonna say, sorry. All right, so as I said, um, the taurine and the glycine help keep the pH low for longer along the gastrointestinal tract, aiding in the paracellular absorption um, of ions from the magnesium citrate. And then um, you can also look um, choose a magnesium supplement by what benefits you would like the carrier to, to give. So for example, um, glycine, so in magnesium glycinate, um, is involved in collagen, creatine, glutathione, and hemoglobin production, and it also acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, oh yes, that's what I was going to say. So the two glycine molecules um, occupy the reactive sites of the magnesium, um, preventing it from forming insoluble complexes with phytates and oxalates. Um, then um, the taurine, so in um, magnesium taurate acts as an antioxidant, it improves insulin sensitivity, and it's known for cardiovascular benefits and its positive influence on bone metabolism. Um, and then the cit citrate um, feeds into the citric acid cycle to support energy production. So um, what does a fully reacted magnesium actually mean? So um, if we have a look at the middle row, that's a fully reacted magnesium. 
So the magnesium is directly bound to the carrier and there's no magnesium oxide involved at all. Um, if a product doesn't say that it's fully reacted, it can contain um, magnesium oxide that um, doesn't have to be declared on the label. So if you have a look at the bottom um, row, that's a buffered magnesium product. Um, it contains magnesium citrate, um, but it also contains magnesium oxide. And um, on a label, the supplement manufacturers don't actually have to disclose the magnesium oxide. So it's really important to always look for a fully reacted magnesium because you, you know that you won't be getting um, hidden magnesium oxide, which is basically cheap, it acts as a filler, but it's really low in bioavailability. And then at the top, we have the magnesium blend, which is magnesium oxide blended with a carrier, such as citrate. And the magnesium oxide um, uh, is really insoluble as well. It's difficult to break that bond between the magnesium and the oxide. All right, and then, um, so there's only a certain amount of magnesium that can be absorbed at any one time, especially if one's only using um, one form of magnesium, like um, a magnesium salt. Um, slightly better if you're using a, a product like our triple magnesium complex, which targets different absorption pathways. But um, even saying that, we split our dose into three daily doses. So if you took 300 milligrams of magnesium in one dose, it would be less effective um, than taking 100 milligrams three times a day. So the more you take in, the less fractional um, amount you will absorb. All right, um, so that, that's the end of the webinar. Um, and we're just within the hour. I'm just going to have a quick look at the question box. Um, all right, I don't see any open questions at the moment. So um, thanks for listening, thanks for joining us. I hope that um, if you're interested, you'll do some more reading on your own and have a look at that um, great review article about magnesium use in gynecological practice. Um, if you do have any other questions or comments, um, let us know um, by email and we'll try and get back to you. Otherwise, thanks for listening and have a good day further.